Thanks for listening to Other People's Flowers. If you'd like to have your work feature on the program, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. We hope you enjoy this episode. This week's story comes from Ted DeMarche. Edward Michael DeMarche usually works in script form for TV and film, though he has enjoyed writing shorter work in prose and has been published by OnSpec, London Business Magazine and Postcard Fiction, among others. He lives in Toronto, Canada, and is grateful to have a beach at the end of his big city block. Sweet Run In her quiet country way, she believed the happiness that lay sleeping in all his creatures would be awakened by finding the one who you will love and who will love you. Angeline Louise believes that in the world that spun for horses, the two who pulled the syrup wagon in comfortable tandem ahead of her, Madame Jersey and Mr. Plank, had found each other and were happy. In the world that spun for her, a world in which time skipped and ran and shook and in some sad times hesitated and fell, in that world she had found the boy. The two horses had been married to each other by arrangement of her father, their temperament and time. Lying in her bed at night, memory mixing the boy's features into the grain of the rough-hewn wood above her bed, Angelina Louise dared to hope for the same. Check the seals, we're coming to Square Gate's patch. Her father held out his hands to take the reins from her. She scrambled back among the clustered buckets. Mind the dress. Her mother made the warning a help rather than the tease it might have been. Of course, she would mind the dress. For the past winter, she had pressed her faith into its pattern and sewn her heart into its seams. The piece of road running beside Mr. Squaregate's land was sorely ignored by its owner. Each year, when they drew close, her father would take the reins and she would check the seals on the buckets. Some years, she just sat and watched the seals for leaks. Other years, she would have to jump around the wagon as lids banged into each other and loosened on their rims. Due in no small way to her diligence, they'd lost very little of the syrup. Rarely did drip lines run sticky along the sides of a scrub buckets on their arrival at Johnson's trade. Proud of this, and knowing her father approved of that pride, she would sit among the buckets, watching for an unsettled lid to pop open, until the ground grew sober again beneath the wagon's wheels. She checked the seals, all fine of course, and settled herself among them to do her duty by her family, and dream of the boy. She was sure she saw him, the year her father had taken her with him into town to trade the syrup. She was five years old, and she remembered the small blonde boy who stood at the back of the loading dock as he watched the men guide the wagons in and out, as a great chestnut mare laboured in harness, drawing air like thunder into its chest. His eyes had moved to the approaching wagon, carrying her and her father. Her mother had seen the look, that passed between the boy and her daughter and asked about it over chores that night. Did he talk to you? Angeline Louise looked down at the cracks in the wooden floor of the kitchen. No, ma'am. He will. But he hadn't. Each year they arrived at Johnson's trade, and he had been there to unload buckets. As always, he looked up at her before pointing out where to draw the horses in. As always, he had shown quiet respect to her father as they moved buckets from the back of the wagon to the wooden dock. As always, he stood quietly by as his father, Mr. Johnson, paid hers for the syrup, and he'd always stood at the edge of the dock as they pulled away with the load of goods she had bought from the trade at her mother's request. They had looked, but they had not met. A season of restless waiting would pass until the sap ran free, and she could be in his presence. Waiting for the brush of his hand to hers as she swung the buckets out to him, their hands sharing a space on the wire handle for a moment. Waiting, waiting, waiting for his never-spoken words of greeting, feeling her own silence like a hive of excited bees bound in a leather bag. This year would be different, she knew it. This year the syrup had run late, but when it ran, it ran long. Two storms early into the winter had taken down more than half the trees in their neighbours' stands. Less exposed in their river valley, her father had still lost those near the top line of the Maple Ridge. They were the lucky ones, and they knew it. The price of the syrup would creep as high as the supply of it would tumble. So they had waited for the last line to clear sap, the last kettle to cook it to syrup, 
the last bucket to be filled and sealed. They had waited for more than two weeks past their normal time to make the annual wagon run. They would be arriving the day of St Martin's dance. This year, they would be for the first time. This year, they would be for the first time since she was a little girl in attendance. And so, of this, she had no doubt, would he? It was why she had worked so hard on the dress, and as late as last night was still pulling pins from her fingers. When they knew they would be going to St Martin's dance, she and her mother had dug through her parents' bedroom closet like miners. Moving old blankets, shirts, pots, books and pillows, they'd reached the cedar basket that lay in the back, tucked under and behind the rest. They had hauled it out through the small wooden door, and together set it up on her parents' bed. These are my dresses. Her mother sat on the edge of the bed and took Angeline Louise's hands. There was a time when these held a kind of magic for me. A magic I needed to lighten hardship when your father and I began our life here. When we were alone and didn't yet know whether we would break this piece of land or it would break us. I wore them. And when I did, your father would look at me like I was his gift from God. I would watch the weight of his young man's burdens melt and lift from his heavily used body. I saw them leave. I watched them go. She placed her hands on her daughter's shoulders, and from inside her own pool of memories she looked at her child's seas of expectation. I would feel myself rise. Her mother opened the basket and pulled out the first of the dresses that were stacked carefully atop one another, unfolding the skirt from the bodice, placing it across the head of the bed. One colour was without a pattern, the colour gold would be if it could rust. This one was for my hair. When I put this dress on, my hair became the sun on an autumn's day in open fields. It was my dress of hoping. I would hold your father and he would hold me and we would dance through the days and nights of our new love, imagining the home we would make together, lost in dreams of harvest. She reached into the basket, drew out a second and laid it across the bed. Blue silk, even in its long sleep, it still held the memory of her mother's shape. A slip beneath the fabric followed the course of the dress like a tear running down a cheek, delicate, precise and full. My dress of waiting. When I drew this one on it was like... She closed her eyes. It was as if I had become this land. I felt exposed and fresh. I felt open to the lightest breeze, the gentlest touch of rain. I was rich, fertile and waiting for a distant warmth. Waiting for those nights when it was your father who became the sun for me. Her mother opened her eyes and blushed, as did Angeline Louise. Then they laughed together, as her mother reached into the basket and drew out the last, still unfinished dress. The first with a pattern, its blues, reds, yellows and greens moved on top and across one another in liquid arrangement. In her mother's hands the colours left one impression, but when it was laid out across the bed it made another. This is my dress of doubt. Your grandmother bought the fabric the winter I turned fifteen and gave it to me on my birthday. The needles, thread, scissors, and advice to help me to fashion a dress for myself came with it. I worked on the dress all through the spring and summer. I'd draw my patterns on kitchen paper and decide how to cut the fabric. I'd change my mind and start again. I worked on it and worked on it, but I didn't finish. I was unsure of myself and afraid to make a start. I was afraid to ruin the beautiful dress I had in my head because of the clumsiness of my hands. I was waiting for a confidence that would not come. The longer I waited, the more afraid I became that it never would. Angeline Louise looked out the window to the barren treetops, where winter birds ran away from each other in the branches. You'll need to work on it to make it fit you. So, between pails of sap hauled out of the trees to the syrup shack, between stacking the cut wood and hauling the chill river water, between supper and bedtime, between her prayers and her dreams, she had. She'd taken it apart, and with her mother's help had taken her own measure. She'd cut, pinned, draped, pressed, folded, and sewn the dress she saw in her mind. She saw it without doubt, for she saw herself already in it, dancing at the St Martin's dance. She wore it now, huddled among the buckets, careful of the dusty floor, watching the seals with one eye, and her visions with another. We're here. They pulled out into the yard while she'd been lost in her thoughts, her father already steering Jersey and Plank towards the trade's loading dock. There was no boy 
Mr. Johnson stood in the boy's place, pointing out where to draw the horses in. Her mother rose out of her seat and stepped onto the wooden platform. Where was the boy? The buckets, Angeline. Her father waited on the dock to unload the syrup, and as her eyes began to cry the tears she knew would be with her for the rest of her life, she bent down and took the handle of the bucket nearest to the back of the wagon, to keep her grief to herself for as long as possible. She saw the hem of the dress under her coat. Angelina Louise? She turned with the bucket in her hands, and he caught the handle like he always had. He straightened in his grey and too big suit. Grey like the winter sky. Grey like the walls of the church, where they would dance that night. Grey like the clouds that were even now racing across the sky, blowing away from her heart. Other People's Flowers was produced by Hugo Gibson, Chris Camon Vutitam, and Hamish Adam Cans. If you'd like to have your work feature on the show, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. Thank you for listening.